Vladimir Putin's ambition to intimidate NATO with his Ukrainian invasion has spectacularly backfired. Far from sowing division and halting expansion, his actions have galvanized the alliance, boosting defense budgets across the board and ushering Finland and Sweden into the fold. How's that for unintended consequences? Previously, we explored Finland's contributions to NATO. Now, it's time to delve into Sweden's dramatic journey into the alliance. Why is Sweden's NATO membership a strategic nightmare for Putin's grand designs? For one, Sweden is seriously considering developing a sixth-generation fighter jet, and despite its historically low level of military spending, its army is highly advanced. But this is all just the tip of the iceberg. Stick around as we dive into all of the reasons Sweden terrifies Putin. Let's begin. Sweden formally applied for NATO membership alongside Finland in May 2022 in response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. For both countries, it was the end of a long tradition of military non-alignment. At the time, Vladimir Putin dismissed the new developments, saying that the two countries joining the alliance would not constitute a threat in itself. Rather, he said that he would only consider it a threat if they deployed a new military infrastructure in their territories. The latter came with a backhanded warning of a response in kind. Privately, though, Putin understood how deep of a blow this is to Russian power in Europe, and he must have been hoping that internal controversy would prevent them from joining. To admit a new member to the alliance, all NATO countries must be in agreement. Turkey stalled entry for Finland and Sweden, claiming that the two countries harbored members of Kurdish groups that it recognizes as terrorist organizations. Finland and Sweden's prohibition on arms exports to Turkey in response to its military operations in Syria in 2019 was also an item of complaint for the Turks. In the Turks' resistance, Vladimir Putin had a hope. Turkey is a purchaser of Russia's S-400 air defense system, which has earned it the ire of the United States. Turkey has also proven a vital lifeline for Russian energy exports and is now Moscow's fourth largest customer. Turkey has also gone through a period of democratic backsliding under Erdogan, who has been in power there in one form or another since 2003. Might the Turks prevent the two new countries from joining after all? Finland proved better able to overcome the Turks' objections, and it joined the alliance on April 4, 2023. Sweden, however, still saw its membership stalled, with Ankara claiming that Stockholm was being more intransigent about its concerns than Helsinki had been. At a summit in Madrid in July 2022, Sweden and Turkey agreed on renewed counter-terrorism cooperation both in and outside of NATO's framework. Additionally, NATO would establish a new office, the Special Coordinator for Counter-Terrorism. However, Turkey claimed that Sweden was dragging its feet on these commitments, particularly as the latter's courts blocked extraditions of individuals that it considered terrorists. Protests in Stockholm, where copies of the Quran were burned and Turkish President Erdogan was hanged in effigy, caused further diplomatic tension. Turkey said that this amounted to a hate crime, while the Swedes said it was an item of free expression. Then there was another obstacle. Hungary also objected to Sweden's NATO membership. Budapest's objections were not specific like Ankara's had been, but Stockholm's accusations about the supposed erosion of the rule of law under Prime Minister Viktor Orban was an item of dispute. The Hungarians denied this and claimed that Sweden's accusations made it a less than trustworthy partner. After complicated diplomatic maneuvering, where Sweden changed some of its domestic laws and relaxed rules over its arms sales to Turkey, the Turkish parliament finally voted to permit Sweden to join NATO in January 2024. Then on February 26, the Hungarian parliament followed suit. The two countries signed an arms deal as part of this agreement. The agreement included Budapest's purchase of four Gripen fighter jets and expanded pre-existing logistics contracts. Vladimir Putin's last hopes had run out. Sweden's entry into the alliance became official when it submitted its instrument of accession to the United States government, which is NATO's depository as outlined in the North Atlantic Treaty. This occurred on March 7, 2024. Although NATO has frequently been criticized for adding members of questionable utility and exposing its members to security commitments that might undermine the collective defense principle enshrined in Article 5, Sweden is not such a case, and it adds a lot to the alliance. First, Sweden's entry into the alliance brings renewed geostrategic vulnerabilities for Putin. The fall of the Soviet Union severely constrained Russia's ability to influence the Baltic. Its current projections into the sea come only with the small enclaves around St. Petersburg and Kaliningrad. Post-Soviet Russia's only choice in the face of this new reality was to heavily fortify Kaliningrad and use it as the center of an anti-access area denial strategy through a buildup of aircraft, anti-ship missiles, and anti-aircraft missiles. Through these, Russia hoped to undermine NATO movements in the Baltic and threaten the commerce of its member states. 
In effect, Russia attempted to do to the Baltic what China has attempted to do to the South China Sea through its island-building campaign. Sweden's entry into NATO is a grave threat to this post-Soviet strategy. It has the largest coastline of any Baltic nation, allowing for free access to and from the North Sea, making it a maritime transit hub that's much more difficult for Russia to disrupt. Sweden's island of Gotland in particular is a strategic area. It's a key pivot point in the Baltic and only 250 kilometers north of Kaliningrad. This is the perfect area for a forward military base, one that can threaten Kaliningrad and carefully observe Russian activity in the area. It's impossible for Russia to send troops and supplies between St. Petersburg and Kaliningrad without transiting close to Gotland. In anticipation of its importance, Sweden is remilitarizing the island as part of its entry into NATO. It's only a matter of time before Stockholm equips it with A2AD assets of its own. Therefore, in any conflict, Kaliningrad will be surrounded and extremely difficult for Russia to reinforce and resupply. Additionally, Sweden's accession to NATO opens up alternative ways to reinforce the vulnerable Baltic states. The Sawalki Gap, the short border between Poland and Lithuania, which is sandwiched between Kaliningrad and Russia's vassal state of Belarus, has long been considered NATO's biggest geostrategic weakness. A pincer movement of Russian forces between these two lines could cut the Baltic states off from their NATO allies by land, while Russia overwhelms them with great numerical superiority over a short front. But with Sweden in the alliance, the Baltic states can now be reinforced through a direct sea route that Russia is in a poor position to dispute. Sweden joining the alliance makes the Baltic, for all practical purposes, a NATO lake. Russia is now surrounded by hostile coastlines in the Baltic Sea, making it practically impossible for it to transit its ships through the area. In any confrontation, NATO is in position to take control of the sea and cut off Russian trade while reinforcing hotspots as needed. Sweden not only brings geographical advantages at sea, but also on land. Its accession to NATO and the reunification of two centuries of military non-alignment also opens an unbroken land corridor between Norway and Finland. If either country were to be attacked along its respective borders with Russia, Sweden can act as a supply and troop transit hub for the other. Sweden's accession to NATO also comes with military advantages. Though often lampooned as being somehow effeminate and lacking vigor in its military affairs, Sweden is better prepared for conflict than many of its European neighbors. Although it does not currently meet its NATO benchmark of 2% of GDP on defense, spending only 1.3% in 2022, that number has steadily increased from a low of 1% in 2018. Stockholm plans to continue with this trend and accelerate it. In 2022, Sweden claimed that it aimed to reach the 2% mark by 2026. In September 2023, Sweden doubled down on this, with its defense ministry saying that it would already meet NATO's definition of the 2% mark in 2024, since the alliance's definition is broader and includes more items than appropriations. Nevertheless, on an official defense ministry document, Stockholm insisted it would not be stopping there. The government intends to continue proposing additional resources in the coming years so that the military defense appropriations will equate to 2% of GDP. Sweden also has an advanced military, despite its historically low level of spending. Among its useful assets is a fleet of 122 Stridsvan tanks, an upgraded variant of the German Leopard 2. Sweden agreed to send 10 of its Stridsvan tanks to Ukraine in February 2023. According to the Oryx blog, Ukraine has since lost six of these, but they demonstrated their worth in an incident from October, where a Russian anti-tank missile destroyed one of the Swedish tanks. However, the crew survived. Sweden thus brings additional tanks to NATO's land forces, ones which protect the lives of valuable tank crews from common anti-armor weapons. Aside from its tanks, Sweden has about 8,000 other vehicles and 26 self-propelled artillery systems, but it's lacking in MLRS systems and towed artillery as it has none of them, according to the Global Firepower Index. Entry into NATO and an increase in its military budget should reduce this deficiency. In the skies, the Swedes command a fleet of about 30 Saab JAS-39 Gripen aircraft. These fourth-generation jet fighters come packed with the beyond-visual-range Meteor air-to-air -air missile, which entered service in 2016. These projectiles have a range of about 150 kilometers, with a no-escape zone of 60 kilometers. The no-escape zone is the area where there is a high probability of a kill, even when the target is notified of the incoming threat. The Meteor's 60-kilometer range for this is the largest among the world's air-to-air -air missiles. The missile is, according to Saab, highly resistant to active and passive countermeasures like chaff, flares, and electronic warfare. Perhaps unsurprisingly, Ukraine has asked Sweden for Gripen fighter jets and in August 2023 claimed that Ukrainian pilots were already training on them. 
In December, Ukraine and Sweden officially began dialogue on whether to donate some of the latter's Gripens to the Ukrainian Air Force. Sweden's entry into the alliance also offers the potential for its air force to get even stronger. Finland, for example, began its F-35 program in December 2021, when Helsinki selected the Lightning II to replace the F-A-18 Hornets in its arsenal. Finland ordered 64 F-35 planes in a deal worth about $9.4 billion. As early as 2014, Sweden signed an agreement to train together with Finland and allow NATO assistance in a crisis. Now that both countries are part of NATO, it's possible and even likely that Sweden will get its own F-35 fleet in the near future, especially since more foreign countries are already opting for it over Sweden's capable Gripen in international arms deals. Sweden has also expressed interest in being part of the multinational effort to develop a sixth-generation fighter jet. It was once part of the Global Air Combat Program alongside the United Kingdom, Italy and Japan, although it officially withdrew from the effort in November 2023. It remains to be seen if Sweden enters another effort to produce a sixth-generation fighter. That same month, Stockholm announced it would hold off on procuring a future fighter until 2031, after which it would assess risks and possibilities. What we do know is that Sweden is starting to think about a fighter to succeed the Gripen so that it can strengthen its air force against future threats. Either way, it will only get stronger over time thanks to the renewed commitments to its domestic defense and its seriousness about its role in NATO. But Sweden's most powerful addition to NATO's arsenal is not on land or in the skies, but on the seas. If Finland's entry provided an almost fatal check to Russian power on land, Sweden does the same on, and even maybe more importantly, under the seas. Although Sweden only has five submarines, three of them are of the advanced Gotland class. These submarines are powered by a novel method, the Stirling Air Independent Propulsion AIP system. Unlike most conventional submarines, the Gotland class uses liquid oxygen stored in onboard tanks to run diesel engines when the vessel's batteries need to be recharged. This means that they do not need to surface as part of this procedure, as a traditional diesel-electric sub must do. The AIP method not only comes with greater stealth, it also allows for deployment periods normally only seen with nuclear submarines. And indeed, consensus is that the Gotland class submarine is the most advanced non-nuclear type ever built. Such long deployments are valuable assets for NATO, even in a defensive role. The Baltic is a narrow area with several natural choke points. Stationing Sweden's Gotland-class submarines in these choke points will enable their crews to listen in on and detect Russian submarines and other naval operations, increasing NATO's intelligence-gathering capacity and its ability to defend vital infrastructure like gas pipelines and underwater communication cables, which Russian submarine crews are trained to find and disrupt or tap into. Sweden's submarines will also be able to stay there for weeks at a time, remaining on constant alert. Ironically, submarine operations in the Baltic have been a traditional weakness in NATO, because with an average depth of only 60 meters, it's too shallow for nuclear-powered subs to operate in. And because the United States Navy's underwater vessels are all nuclear-powered, they have not been able to contribute to the security of the Baltic. The importance of this security is often overlooked, as the Baltic is one of the world's busiest shipping areas, accounting for roughly 15% of the world's maritime trade. Sweden's entry into NATO mitigates this security deficiency. The Baltic also has varying salinity levels due to the large amounts of rivers that feed it. This variation changes the buoyancy of a submarine and the amount of noise it makes. One must know these waters to stay silent. And because Sweden has been operating submarines in the Baltic since 1904, longer than any other country, it has institutional experience that no other state can match. Submarine flotilla commander Frederick Linden perhaps best described the situation in an interview with Reuters. We have expertise which fills a gap, expertise that NATO doesn't have. Two more submarines are scheduled for delivery in Sweden by 2028. This new type, called the A-26, will be able to launch remote-controlled or autonomous underwater drones to further increase intelligence collection and reduce risk to the crew. Sweden has a robust surface fleet too, with 35 fleet units in its active inventory as of 2024, according to the World Directory of Modern Military Warships. These ships are mostly light corvettes and offshore patrol vessels, but it will also bring nine valuable mine warfare ships. At the very least, Sweden's entry into NATO adds to Russia's naval disadvantages in the Baltic. The Kremlin simply does not have the numbers or the firepower to compete with NATO's naval forces there, and it will not be able to do so anytime soon. NATO's combined navy has gotten much stronger with Sweden's membership, while the balance has tipped even more against Russia. For Putin, this is likely a big personal blow to his pride. 
Like many Russian rulers before him, stretching back to Peter the Great, he has fancied his country as a sea power, and has tried but failed to restore the Russian Navy's Soviet-era capabilities. Now Russia's access to the world's waterways is even further restricted, and it all came because of its latest dictator's own actions. But the Swedes don't intend to add to NATO only through air and sea power. Stockholm has every intention of doing so on land as much as it can. In that regard, the Swedes pledged to increase the size of their army by 30,000 personnel, with a 2025 timetable bringing the total up to 90,000. The 2024 budget includes investments in order to make this happen, such as increased appropriations for officer training. The new troops will be a welcome addition to the forward missions of NATO's multinational battle groups, which have been deployed in increased numbers to the countries bordering Ukraine since the start of the invasion. In the worst-case scenario, Sweden's bigger army will constitute a nearby reserve on an immediate call to help the beleaguered and outnumbered Baltic states. Sweden also has a reserve force of 32,900 personnel, plus 25,000 paramilitary troops. It has a total manpower reserve of 4.2 million. Overall, Sweden's military is ranked 29th in the 2024 list provided by the Global Firepower Index. In addition to its existing military technology and assets, Sweden has a robust arms industry, despite its traditional neutrality. This gives the country a good foundation to actually carry through with its stated intentions on building a modern military. It's in a much better position to rearm than Germany, for example, whose frequent pledges to increase military spending have always fallen short. Sweden's arms industry will also be able to help other NATO members rearm adequately, and thanks to its strategic position, Sweden can serve as a convenient nearby hub to manufacture equipment and ammunition, which the war in Ukraine has shown gets depleted at a staggering rate in a peer or near-peer conflict. Russia's invasion of Ukraine deeply disturbed the nations of Europe. It was disturbing enough for Sweden to end over 200 years of military neutrality, which prevailed even during both world wars. In fact, the last time Sweden entered an armed conflict was in 1814 with the Swedish-Norwegian War. Thanks to Putin's decision to invade Ukraine, that has now changed, and Sweden is arming once again. Historically, Russia was Sweden's greatest enemy, and Putin clearly recalled unpleasant memories for the Swedes, no matter how deeply buried they were. Putin may have wanted to weaken the transatlantic alliance through an easy victory in Ukraine, but his failure to scare the world with the Russian military might only have made his geopolitical disadvantage worse. With Sweden's imminent entry, NATO is now stronger, and the vice around Russia in the Baltic is all but closed. Russia is now at its weakest position there since the Great Northern War in the early 18th century. The Swedes under Charles XII lost that conflict, and Russia soon became the preeminent power in the Baltic. Over two centuries later, it almost feels like the ghost of Charles XII is finally having the last laugh. Russia's current dictator Putin may walk away from his war with some territorial gains in Ukraine, but for him, was it worth the balance of power tipping even more in NATO's favor thanks to Sweden's entry into the alliance? He can pretend all he likes that none of this bothers him, but hold up in the Kremlin, he probably isn't too happy about this development, to say the least. Meanwhile, Sweden is in a military alliance with all the other Scandinavian states for the first time since the Kalmar Union in 1523. Putin's aggression united the Nordic countries in a way not seen in five centuries. So much for weakening and overawing the West. What do you think about Sweden's accession to NATO? In what other ways might it alter European geopolitics? Don't forget to let us know in the comments. Now, go and check out why is Sweden preparing for war with Russia? Or click this other video instead. Also, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe for more military analysis from Military Experts.